I'd like to start by thanking you all for having me. It's such a sincere pleasure to be here in Montreal, which is the capital of, as we know, music cognition and good food. So I'm really grateful for that. Um, it seems that no matter what I get interested in about music, that one or another mid-century theorist had something to say about it. And um, I, along with everybody else, tend to start my talks by quoting Leonard Meyer. And just for the sake of variety, I thought I'd quote from the other 1956 <laughs> um, major work of music theory that year, Victor Zuckerkendall's Sound and Symbol. Um, and this is just another example of uh, these two guys sort of getting to everything. Um, so he said, music can never have enough of saying over again what has already been said, not once or twice, but dozens of times. Hardly does a section, which consists largely of repetition, come to an end before the whole story is happily told all over again. So here we have um, Zucker Kendall acknowledging uh, the hyper-repetitive nature of uh, music. And then more recently, Jonathan Dunsby uh, lamenting the lack of study of this phenomenon. So he says, the music of many cultures is characterized by lengthy musical repetitions, especially where ceremony, text, and dance determine the amount of music needed. In Western classical music, formal repetition is an especially prominent feature. Considering the number of pieces in the customary concert repertoire which include repeats, even the casual observer may be surprised to see only a dozen column inches devoted to the topic in the New Grove Dictionary of 1980, with only five bibliographical references, all to peripheral sources. The dictionary entry is, however, well focused, with examples to support its general theme that, the, this is quoting from the New Grove now, the evolution of the notation, its exact interpretation, and the practice of making repeats raise certain problems, not all of which have obvious solutions. <laughs> Um, and this is still true of the New Grove, as you can find it today. It's just a few, it's a short article uh, to largely the same effect. And then I thought I should also bring in the old guard, just so we're sure that our activities are sanctioned. And um, so here we have Schenker uh, saying that our understanding of musical technique would have advanced much further if only someone had asked where, when, and how did music first develop its most striking and distinctive characteristic repetition. Why is it that we accept, even enjoy, degrees of repetition in music that would be repugnant in almost any other domain? That's the question I want to start with, but as we'll see later, this distinction in repetition prevalence between music and other domains, like language, might turn out to be chimerical. But we can agree that music is the canonical domain of repetition, and that when we reinterpret another domain to emphasize its repetitiveness, we are uh, examining a quasi-musical aspect of that domain. Repetition in music is of two sorts. Not only is there often a large amount of repetition within particular pieces, as Zucker Kendall observes, but we also tend voluntarily to re-expose ourselves to familiar pieces again and again and again. So we're dealing with lots of within-piece repetition and also lots of between-piece repetition. And an interesting preliminary issue is whether these repetitions are of the same ilk. Do within-piece and between-piece repetitions have the same effect on enjoyment, for example, on memory? Does repeating a 32-measure section within a piece have the same effect as playing a 32-measure piece twice? There's a stubborn repeatability to music at every turn that philosophers, ethnomusicologists, cultural historians, semiticians, theorists, and composers have banged their head against for ages. In most cases, banged their heads against and then sort of abandoned in short succession. But it's only recently that cognitive scientists have begun to turn their attention to this phenomenon, and it's the claim of this paper that this particular brand of head banging cognitive science against musical repetition, in conjunction with a certain tenacity, a commitment to making repetition a center of inquiry rather than a peripheral issue, might be especially productive. So Bruno Nettle identifies repetition, so Bruno Nettle is an ethnomusicologist, identifies repetition as a musical universal, um, find, finding it in all cultures, uh, all known cultures, and W. Tecumseh Fitch calls it a design feature of music. As a composer explicitly concerned with generating a sense of structure in music, Schoenberg admitted that intelligibility in music seems to be impossible without repetition. Kivy notes that musical notation is rife with symbols that instruct players to repeat, from the repeat sign to the tremolo to simili marks and da capo. Repetition seems to be a fundamental feature of the music of all known cultures. It's fun to make up a little melody and then repeat it a bunch of times. Try it. Do not do this around children or you'll never be allowed to stop. Don't do this around adults if you want them to be your friends. Repeated tunes are likely to burrow in where they aren't wanted in the form of earworms, those ditties that seem to get irrevocably stuck in your head. Repetition is an important component of music's shareability, 
of its social and biological role in the creation of interpersonal cohesion. Just imagine a teacher in a nursery school getting kids to join in on the itsy bitsy spider, all of them mimicking her closely. At many nursery schools, they have songs that feature in their everyday routine, a cleanup song, for example, that everybody sings at the appropriate transition time every day. Or imagine a responsorial psalm in a church, the leader teaching the congregation a new responsorial and then repeating it after each verse. Imagine a group of children playing Ring Around the Rosy or adults at midnight on New Year singing Old Lang Syne. Repeatability is how songs come to be the property of a group or of a community instead of an individual, how they come to belong to a tradition rather than to a moment. Deborah Tannen put forth a theory that much more speech than we normally acknowledge is comprised of formulaic expressions. Memorize sequences of words, such as those you find in idioms and proverbs. These are often the first thing adults immersing themselves in a new language learn, stock phrases such as, how are you? Uh, Van Licker, Sittis, and Rallin analyzed the instances of formulaic expressions in a screenplay and found them to constitute a full 25% of the text. Pauli and Snyder found that formulaic expressions are processed more quickly than similar length sequences generated creatively. Conklin and Schmidt showed that they were also read more quickly. So while many theorists, most recently Gerdingen, have demonstrated that music is compiled of stock patterns, riffs, and schemata, this may not distinguish it so pronouncedly from language. It would be fascinating to see a corpus study that compared the incidence rate of formulaic expressions in language with that of what we might call formulaic expressions in music. Given the wealth of recent research examining overlap between music and language, a comparative account of repetition, a fundamental mechanism of both domains, seems particularly desirable. Bruce Richmond postulates this formulaic repetition as the shared origin of music and language. I'm going to quote from his chapter in the 2001 book, In the Origins of Music. Um, in the beginning, speech and music making were one and the same. This is his uh, idea or opinion. They were collective, real-time repetitions of formulaic sequences. This drive to repeat throws people into language and into vocal interactions with each other. It also ensures that their interactions will be in rhythmic synchrony with each other as the repetitions create an interactive rhythm. Such interactive rhythmic synchrony is crucial for people being able to predict and understand the communicative moves and movements of others. Finally, it ensures that people constantly show and demonstrate their agreement and acceptance of language terms by repeating them." End quote. He points to nonsense formulas like eeny, meeny, miny, mo" as examples of this kind of communication. Vocalizations whose component parts lack individual meaning, but acquire meaning as a whole through their social function. Music psychology has been quite preoccupied with looking at the ways in which music might be similar to language, but Richmond, Tannen, and others might be understood to be asking the inverse question. When is language processed musically? This question has been examined in terms of beat structure and intonation, but it might also be considered in terms of repetition structure. Music takes place in time, but repetition beguilingly makes it knowable in the way of something out of time. Our experience of expectation, as Leonard Meyer has observed, is often a felt rather than a cognized phenomenon. This gets into the issue of conceptual thing that he referred to earlier. We hear the dominant leading into the tonic, leading forward into it, and share this sense of directedness in time. To some extent, always, but especially when the music's familiar, when it's been repeated. Each moment seems not like a bead strung along a necklace resting next to dozens of other beads, but more like a drink just when it starts to be poured. The cascade of liquid is so much a part of the gesture as to seem to be contained within it. And I just realized my cell phone is not going to control the PowerPoint. <laughs> um, so you can find phenomenologists, of course, talking a lot about this from the um, philosophy and then also psychology and then in music, perhaps the closest or thir most thorough examination we have of this, well, it comes with Judy Lockhead and Thomas Clifton, but also with um, David Lewins in his article. So repetition makes it possible for us to experience a sense of expanded present, characterized not by the explicit knowledge that it will, uh, X will occur at time point Y, but rather a deja vu-like sense of orientation and involvement. So otherwise, uh, in other words, the claim here is that um, although we're always experiencing these, these kinds of pretension, even when music's uh, new to us, that that's occurring in a special way when we, we know precisely what it is that's going to come next. There are clear biological rationales for experiencing pleasure when predictions are fulfilled, as David Huron explores in his 2006 book, Sweet Anticipation. Such pleasure can be thought of as rewarding successful prediction and encouraging more of it in the future. Familiar music can have a transportive quality connected to the loss of self experiences chronicled in Alf Gabrielson's work on strong experiences of music. Part of this may relate to the special way that surrounding events and sensations can seem to glom on to musical experiences, such that when we rehear familiar repertoire, uh, vivid episodic memories arise. 
sorry, I'm just thinking about what to skip because there are really not too many things. So um, consider then a common earworm, if you dare. I don't actually know how to do this from over here, so I'm gonna move this one. This is the part where we uh, combat the forces of the dark and warm room with something that you can't help but. Oh, that's very loud. Sorry, it's so loud. Right? So right now we're all sharing a particular percept. <laughs> for better or for worse. <laughs> that percept going something like this. Did that work for y'all? It's still working. <laughs> <laughs> Yet, if I show you this image, you know what the missing part looks like, but it doesn't seem to own your brain in the way the missing music did. For one thing, you could probably imagine the missing part of the image and then voluntarily put it aside. But you couldn't imagine the rest of the music and put it aside. The music had to play to a resting point in your head, however long that took. And worse, after it stopped, there's a chance it might have started replaying, as it clearly did for <laughs> the one in the second row here. It is my intuition that one reason for this stickiness is that we can't conjure up one musical moment and leave it. If our brain flits over any part of the music, we're captured by it and must play it forth to a point of rest. So we constantly have a sense of being gripped, even unwillingly, by the tune. And it's been observed that earworms are usually tunes. It's something with trajectory and time, not timbres or special harmonies. So in the very way we remember music, there's some need for it to play itself out again and again. Every time we recollect a musical performance, it's to a certain extent a replay. This link between memory and repetition pulls us into repeated music, invites us to inhabit it. We know what it's like to think that phrase. When we know what's coming in a musical excerpt, the listening becomes a motion, an enactment. It moves us. We're constantly in the future as we listen, such that we can seem to embody it. And I'm influenced here by um, Eric Clark's seminar on music and subjectivity uh, this summer at uh, the Mannes Institute. My claim is that part of what makes us feel that we're a musical subject rather than a musical object is that we're endlessly listening ahead such that sounds seem almost to execute our volition after the fact. This sense of super expressive voice can be pleasurable in and of itself. It's the pleasure of expansion, of movement beyond limits, of increased power, all characteristic of strong experiences of music as chronicled by existing experimental work. So I'm thinking of Gabriel's work again here. Repetition, I would then argue, encourages embodiment, and this embodiment contributes to musical pleasure. Some modicum of empirical support for this notion comes from neuroimaging work by Peter Yanada, which shows that when people listen to familiar music in comparison to when they listen to unfamiliar music, there's widespread activation within structures that underlie sequencing and motor planning. This is consistent with the notion that an embodied kind of forward listening characterizes uh, rehearing. Permit me to erect a straw man for a moment, because this one plagues us even though we know he's flimsy. Music is communicative in the sense that it conveys information. Repetition is one of the things that shows us that this, flatly understood, cannot be true. Once you read Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, you don't need to keep revisiting the text. In fact, it may be that reading a five-page summary of the book would suffice. The book conveys information, and once that goal's been accomplished, there's little need to repeat the experience. But imagine hearing Beethoven's Fifth Symphony and being done, or hearing a five-minute summary and being done. Part of this difference is an issue of grain, so just as this um, image becomes perhaps less interesting and more tossable once you see the Dalmatian, you see the Dalmatian, uh, but seems to reward lots of staring and seeking and blobs scrutinizing before you recognize the Dalmatian, it depends on the kind of information we're seeking. Do we want simply to identify an object? Or are we approaching the illustration aesthetically, a mode of appreciation self-help books do not recognize or reward? Part of the aesthetic orientation is a perceptual openness, a willingness to notice and believe in connections and meanings that may not be instantly apparent. If we trusted these blobs to convey ever richer associations and patterns to us the longer we looked, we might want to keep revisiting this drawing. Knox observes that repetition in spoken di discourse prompts the hearer to seek implicit meaning in utterances by indicating that the speaker aims at a meaning different than that conveyed by uttering an expression only once. 
Thus, when ideas are complex or words are insufficient, speakers may repeat their utterances in order to engage their hearers in interpretive efforts to make more of what it's said. Music's function is obviously not to convey information. Music's function is obviously not to convey information. Do you see how profound that just got? <laughs> Why did you just say it again? Um, but so music's repetitive nature seems to be bound up with this other function, its aesthetic function, if you will. But it seems not a consequence merely of aesthetics. We revisit favorite paintings, favorite films, and so forth, and we can you know, go forward and think about music and poetry and how willing we are to reread poems. I'm going to gloss over that a little bit. Um, so rereading or rehearing, to take a closer example, familiar poetry is, I would argue, a less consuming experience than rehearing familiar music. Even if you love Robert Frost, you don't hear two roads diverged and think, yes, the way you might when you hear the opening notes of a favorite song. Um, you could duck out of the poem fairly easy, easily, whereas a snippet of familiar music triggers a cascade of that song that takes over and won't let you go. Interestingly, it's much harder to memorize a poem than a song. At first glance, this would seem to make repetition more desirable for poems than for music, where we're able to know how it goes uh, much more quickly. That the reverse is true suggests that the pleasure we derive from musical repetitions must come more from a sense of inhabiting the music, a <coughs> transportive kind of experience, rather than from knowing more about it. Indeed, recent theoretical work by Carolyn Abate has questioned the centrality of knowing within musical experience. And my paper, When Program Notes Don't Help, <laughs> forthcoming in Psychology of Music, presents some empirical support for the notion that people enjoy music more when they aren't given explicit information about it. Perhaps the most dramatic evidence for the special role of repetition in music comes from Diana Deutsch's speech to song illusion. Are you all familiar with that already? Probably most of you, but um, I see some people shaking their heads, so I think it's worth playing. So we're first going to hear a sentence, and then a part of that sentence is repeated. The sounds as they appear to you are not only different from those that are really present, but they sometimes behave so strangely as to seem quite impossible. But they sometimes behave so strangely. They sometimes behave so strangely. 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 So strangely, so strangely, so strangely, so strangely. And now we're going to hear the original sentence again. The sounds as they appear to you are not only different from those that are really present, but they sometimes behave so strangely as to seem quite impossible. Don't know if that describes your <laughs> experience. <laughs> Uh, the second time. So a similar phenomenon, first described by Severance and Washburn in 1907, is semantic satiation, whereby repeated viewings, utterances, or hearings of the same word causes it to seem to degenerate into nonsense. Not just any nonsense, however, but a nonsense <clears throat> in which the semantics vanish and are replaced by a sort of supersalience of the component parts, letters, phonemes, and syllables. We have people chronicling this experience and saying, the loopedness of the L is so intriguing. You know, people get very... Uh, into it. So in the famous Dalmatian picture, it's as if the sense of the Dalmatian had disappeared, which is very difficult to do at will, once you know the Dalmatian's there, and been replaced by a renewed sensitivity to the characteristics of the blobs. It's interesting that repetition can cause language to dissolve into nonsense on the one hand, or music on the other. This is not the first, nor the last time today, that the effect of repetition will suggest an affinity between those domains, an affinity, I might add, that I do not view as demeaning to music, in the least. Semantic satiation has sometimes been explained in terms of attention. Bored with repeated encounters with the same signified word, attention shifts to the only other available level, the constituent parts of the word. Or, in the case of the speech to song illusion, from the sense of the word to the melody within it. What's remarkable in this example is that in shifting this way, we have the sensation that we're approaching the stimulus not in a slightly different manner, but rather as if it were a completely different stimulus altogether, as if speech had magically been transformed into music. Indeed, it could be argued that music is more about the nature of the blobs than about emergent Dalmatians. There's a long literature devoted to this issue. Um, see, for example, Diana Rathman's book from 1993. 
New nuanced objects are more compelling on repetition. It's not that we extract a Dalmatian and can move on, but rather that there's always a richness just out, out of conscious grasp. So there is this sense in which the thing is known, yet constantly rediscovered, and this may result in a satisfying pull toward the present moment, perhaps a prerequisite for the loss of self chronicled by Gabrielson. The more a piece is repeated, the more we think we know it, and the greater the joy of discovery when we're surprised by the blobs. There's a point here where I believe that Paul Sylvia's notion of interest as an emotion becomes relevant. I would submit that interest is an important part of our emotional response to music and that repetition facilitates the interest response. To my knowledge, the notion of interest as an affective response to music has not been deeply explored, but if some of you know literature on that subject, I'd be very eager to hear about it. But what are the justifications for treating repetition as its own phenomenon rather than as a special case of more general similarity relations in music? The first motivation is pragmatic. Elaine Sisman observes that repetition is a topic of daunting size. If we pan out from explicit repetition to parallels and similarity, we've suddenly included virtually all, rather than merely most, music under the study's purview. This seems unmanageable. The second motivation is grounded in empirical work. For example, in studying semantic satiation induced by spoken recitations of a word, Pallotti et al. found that repeated utterances of a single voice triggered the effect. When the stimuli were merely similar, the same word uttered by different speakers, no satiation took place. When they were truly identical, the same word uttered by the same speaker, the result was qualitatively different. Moreover, Monaghan sought to directly investigate whether repetition of identical stimuli is a special case for learning, or whether it's better conceived of as one endpoint on a continuum um, of, of similarity. He investigated learning for tone sequences that included different types of patterns, including repetition. Patterns featuring repetition were learned differently and better than other types. His results, and I quote, supported the claim made in Endress et al. that identical repetition is a special case for learning, end quote. Monaghan goes so far as to claim that this poses a problem for the mechanism of statistical learning. But the question is, if there's something special going on with repetition, what is it? Borges's Pierre Ménard, author of The Quixote, is fiction in the style of a review of a word-for-word -word rewriting of chapters from Cervantes' book by the fictional contemporary writer Pierre Ménard. We're told that, quote, the text of Cervantes and that of Ménard are verbally identical, but the second is almost infinitely richer, end quote. This could certainly be said of many reprises in familiar repertoire, the end of Gooder Demerung with the recurrence of the redemption motive, the end of the Goldberg variations with the repeat of the aria, where intervening context, or even perhaps the absence of intervening context, conspires to make something that is ostensibly the same found, sound very different. Edward Cohn puts so much stock in changing context that he believes, quote, in general, there's no such thing as true redundancy in music, end quote. Yet Kivy, in the fine art of musical repetition, protests, but still it repeats. <laughs> so there are important senses in which context reconfigures sound, such that no repetition is truly redundant, but there are also senses in which we have to account for the fact that we do experience many recurrences as repetition. And Dura Hannanen, I think, addresses this uh, paradox the best um, with the term recontextualization in her, her spectrum paper from not too long ago. At a minimum, a repeated element will sound different from its initial presentation by virtue of coming later and having been heard before. More subtly, it will sound different as a function of its position within the unfolding series of metric projection with um, uh, these diagrams of, of hasty. Uh, if one note functions as a beginning, the next might seem like a continuation, distinguishing the pitches phen phenomenologically even if they look identical on the page. Or you might uh, consider the phenomenon of subjective rhythmization. Even a string of repeated notes then sounds not like a series of undifferentiated hammer strokes, <coughs> excuse me, but rather like a hierarchically unfolding series of projections and realizations, such that each note in the sequence possesses different qualities. One might seem to start, one to continue, one to anticipate, simply by virtue of their succeeding one another in time. By duplicating surface content, repetition can draw attention to those dynamic processes of projection, engaging listeners in the raw temporal processes of music. Repetition can occur at any level of any entity across any time scale within pieces or between pieces. I'd like to take a moment to survey um, just a few of these possibilities. 
Repetition seems more identifiable the more the repeating element is perceived categorically. Um, this is most usually the case for pitch and duration. It can also be the case for timbre, but in much of Western music, timbre has been understood as a secondary sort of element. So not all, but some, most, so that the repetition of a particular instrumentation accompanied by new pitches and durations seems less like a repetition than a repetition of the same pitches and durations with a new instrumentation. So context could obviously change that, but I'm just talking about for lots of Western music that we're familiar with. Um, indeed, McAdams observes that transformations, such as variations, are most often, although not always, built on these dimensions. Uh, contrast these two examples, where the first clearly seems like a repetition, despite the changing dynamics and tempi, but the second does not, despite the replication of the dynamic marking. Issues of what get conceptualized as a repetition are complex and bound up with notions of identity and work, topics explored more comprehensively in Lydia Gurr's Imaginary Museum of Musical Works. So let's take first the smallest possible unit of repetition according to this scheme, the individual note. Let's consider uh, this example from Mozart's C minor fantasy in a uh, performance by Friedrich Gulde. So the F sharps needn't be repeated. It's easy to imagine another iteration of the chord followed by a quarter note rest. The repetition metaizes itself, makes us conscious of its composedness. It brings attention into the F sharp such that when a D major chord enters underneath it, there's this sudden sense of expanse. It intensifies the sense of anacrusis, pointing attention at the downbeat of the next measure. Um, it creates paradoxically a sense of muteness. After the repetition of the half cadence with its preceding gesture and then the chord, the insistence on the single note underscores that we've reached the end of possible expression of this thing. And this sense permits the D major harmony to enter as if from some other space. But repetitions of a single pitch are only noticeable normally when they're immediate or almost immediate. For example, the A sharp in this example from the well-tempered clavier. But even in a simple tune like uh, Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, uh, the average listener probably wouldn't be aware that twinkle and R occupy the same pitch. Not only is pitch normally experienced relationally rather than in absolute terms, but it's also assimilated into gestures whose repetitions are much more recognizable than their constituent elements. However, it's worth knowing, noting that repetitions that are not recognized can nevertheless play important roles in music perception. Um, it's been observed that the Krumhansel Kessler tone profile, which tracks people's judg judgments of how well various scale degrees fit a tonal context, closely matches the typical distribution, the raw frequency counts, of these scale degrees in tonal repertoires, suggesting that the raw frequency with which various pitches occur might contribute to the identification of key, even if these distributions aren't uh, available, per se. Uh, but this example illustrates that to hear something as a repetition, you must first hear it as a something. In this way, repetition detection can be a useful methodology to investigate the nature of perceptual units. Uh, Dora Hannon, and I'd just like to quote her one more time, um, repetition presumes recognition of a thing that's repeated. To recognize this thing, we must abstract the thing from its context, end quote. So it's only when a single note has been treated specially that we want to thingize it in this way. I ran a study this fall, uh, the data from which are uh, not completely analyzed, uh, during which I asked people simply to press a button whenever they heard anything repeat within short one to two minute pieces. My question was, what makes a within piece repetition easy to detect and what makes it difficult? How much of the effect is due to the nature of the thing being repeated, whether it's, for example, a two-note motive or an eight-measure phrase, and how much of it is due to context, whether the repetition occurs immediately or after intervening material, for example. Each participant heard and performed the task for each piece four times, so is also able to look at the effect of repeated exposures on repetition detection. Um, so uh, simply in coding this data to put in um, the file necessary to, to analyze it, it was clear that for one particular type of repetition, there were no zero cases of correct identification in any of the four pieces on any of the four repetitions. And this was repetition of a um, smaller motivic element that forms a part of a larger, more salient gesture, where this element was repeated not within the larger gesture, but as part of another, different, longer, more salient gesture. For example, these shaded three notes, despite their parallel placement at the start of each two-bar unit, uh, were not ever identified as a repeating element by any participant. Yet repetitions of shorter elements are salient in many other sorts of contexts. Uh, William Kaplan has examined how the repetition of motives conspires to define the basic material of pieces in the classical style. Um, so 
Let me just play the opening of the sonata discussed in his book, performance by Daniel Barenboim. <laughs> Though it's possible to make sense of this immediate and nearly exact repetition in many ways, but the fact remains that it's pleasant. The repetition is pleasing. It feels good to retrace this little gesture. Um, and you can hear kind of uh, Carolyn Abate in her, um, her, her paper uh, on uh, drastic versus gnostic talks about this sort of, uh, this kind of pleasure. It's a bit like watching an object rotate in space, except that it's rotating in time. Because as metric pro projections evolve, I'm thinking in Hastian terms here, the high Gs, which were heard as a beginning in measure one, possess a new element of continuation in measure three. This transformation is subtly emphasized with the extra repetition of, of G. One of the things a repeat does is to elevate hypermeter to an object of enjoyment and experience on its own. When the surface content simply repeats, the few things that do change, metric placement, for example, are rendered more salient. With a two-bar stretch foreordained, attention can shift further toward the future. In this way, it's my guess that repeats can function similarly to silence in some contexts, in the sense that they relieve the burden of processing new information so that some other thing can be attended to. This can form a basis for uh, metacommunicative functions in repetition um, that are similar to the metacommunicative functions of silence that I talk about in the current issue that's out right now of JMT. The difference is, like some repeats in conversation, uh, which are there expressly to preserve the rhythm of the interaction. And I'll give you an example of this. Um, John Stone analyzes classroom discourse in terms of uh, this goal. So you find a teacher, as, as they're writing on the board, saying Mercury. So Mercury, just to sort of keep that element alive and keep the, the rhythm of the conversation going, so the, the room's not dead. Um, so repeats preserve the metric rhythm in this way, or preserve the rhythm in this way, whereas silence often interrupts it. Moreover, repetition is reassuring and unchallenging in a way that's quite opposite to silence. At the same time, repetitions afford a broadening of the temporal horizon so that there's the uh, expansive pleasure of sort of zooming out and attending at a higher level of the structural hierarchy. Um, okay, I'm going to skip a little bit here and just say that uh, if you think about GTTM, uh, Laird and Jackendorf's GTTM, um, we note that for every possible element of that theory, repetition um, is, is part one of the preference rules. And what this has to do with at large, I'm taking longer explaining this than it would have been to read the paper. Um, I, this is about that when we hear something repeated, we, we, we sort of want it to be the same thing that we heard the first time. And that um, we'll, we'll, we'll try to assign it a representation that gives it the same metric uh, setup and everything so that we can, um, that, that thing has stayed stable. And I think this, is, this reflects um, a desire for repetition to be sort of a, a, a foothold into, um, into music. That this is something we can kind of know and learn and, and build other musical structures uh, around. So um, this is an example of uh, a piece by Rameau that I think I'm not going to discuss as much detail as I planned, uh, where what happens is we have some repetition that gets um, to be of smaller and smaller units in a way that guides your attention such that the span that's uh, you're busy, busy dealing with gets smaller and smaller and smaller um, across the course of its opening measures, and then it sort of um, expands out in a way that's very salient on on listening. And that this seems to be sort of part of the the real time experiences of this this music's form, if you if you want to look at it that way. Um, and the the Rameau example also illustrates the the obvious but important fact that repetition can occur proximally. So uh, where the repetition immediately succeeds its model, or distally, where something different intervenes between a model and its repetition. Um, it's distal repetitions of the type th that, that we saw in the Rameau that are often thought to be important in defining a piece's form. Unlike immediate repetitions of the sort that could be notated with repeat signs, which have a more checkered reception history, which I'll discuss later. During a longer repeat, the barrage of new stimuli retreats for a moment, allowing the listener to step back and survey her musical surroundings. It puts the control of listening back in her hands. Without new material to process, she can reflect on what happened previously or what might happen much further down the road. Um, repetition tends to reify a passage and to set it apart from the surrounding context as a thing to be mused on or abstractly considered. And uh, John Ron has spoken a lot about this. And, um, I think I'll skip that. Uh, 
So uh, Ron sees constant enrichment, this constant recontextualizing, as the core of our appetite for repetition in music. But this account leaves unexplained why the pleasure is concentrated in the art of music and does not extend to, say, literature. Um, this is where I would suggest the limits of music's abstractability play a role. When a thing's communicated in speech, it's normally separable from the precise words used to describe it. So psychologists speak of that um, as verbatim memory. For example, I could say, the millage election failed or the millage didn't pass, or people voted down the millage. Can you tell I wrote this when I was bitter? <laughs> and two special things seem to me to be the case. Number one, we derive more or less the same information from these three statements. And if asked to repeat the information, we might present it in one or the other of the forms from the one in which we originally heard it. The content seems divorceable from the vessel in which it was delivered. Number two, this content is capable of being apprehended at a different time scale than the one offered by the spoken text. It takes a certain amount of time to say the millage election failed, but I don't think it takes precisely this amount of time to reflect on this fact. So this is a restatement of what I was claiming earlier. To the contrary, this fact can be apprehended in a moment. It can be taken as an image. You can just see sort of a millage with a line through it. Um, but neither of these hold for melody. The closest thing to number one, deriving more or less the same information from differently worded statements, might be variations, but it's clear that varying a theme changes its content in a way that varying the wording of a fact does not. And the existence of earworms speaks against number two. Once the melody gets going in your head, even if involuntarily, it tends to make its merry way to a cadence rather relentlessly, and in doing so to occupy precisely the amount of time it would take to really hear that melody performed. Um, suppose that I asked you to imagine the tones on which what you are sung in Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. So to do that, you probably have to start at twinkle and go through note by note until you get to what you. Now I want to know when the note recurs. You probably have to sing, sing still further until you got to high. You can't duck in and out of music mid-phrase. You have to mentally sing through until you get to the spot you want. This apparent fact that music cannot be retrospectively grasped without a mental or actual replay could serve as a foundation on which both the excessive use of and appetite for musical repetition might be understood. So I've talked about repetition of um, notes and motives, but what about repetition at the level of phrase? And um, here we have the interesting situation that quite often the, the cadence is altered. And I have, I have some examples of this, but I think I'll just, instead of going through all this, I'm just going to play you this and then play you another one and um, make a claim about uh, a change in your perception. So this is an example from um, Schumann's Opus 68. <laughs> So then if you contrast that with a piece from the same collection. So the claim I want to make is that um, because the cadence isn't altered here, that it's not just our perception of the cadence that changes, but rather our perception of this entire uh, uh, second, second phrase, so that um, in the first case, we sort of had this sense of that we're going to be going to the tonic, and that changed the whole, the whole thing for us, um, and ma making it seem much more like a continuation, versus here, I can take this much more as sort of a reliving of the first thing. It's, it's um, uh, identity as, as repetition is, is much more salient for me. And um, additionally, it, it has a metric uh, resonance in, in my mind. So the downbeat quality of this first measure when it recurs in measure five is much more strongly preserved to my ears. And um, this passage seems like a phrase and an affirmation of the phrase rather than a single larger subject. So that when I would sort of go back and reflect on this or if I'd had to have an earworm about it, that in the first case, it would be eight measures long. Like I couldn't phone out <laughs> until eight measures were done. Versus here, each thing has more of an um, independent identity such that I could sort of just imagine four, four measures and, and then be done with it. Uh, I'd just like to play one more example. I might uh, duck out of this before the whole thing finishes. But from the same collection. about that is just how um, remarkably little happens. 
And um, I just think this is a great example to disabuse anyone of the notion that repetition is uh, conveying new information. Uh, this seems rather to me more like an invitation to sort of sing along. It has that that kind of equality, and, and uh, indeed the, the title here has to do with um, um, song, and it feels like there's a sort of ritualization that occurs, such that a listener increasingly belongs to the piece um, across across the course of it. Uh, so um, additionally, I, I find that these measures come to seem sort of more subtle to me with repetitions, and it's similar to that effect where uh, if I want you to really think that what I'm saying is profound or find new resonance in it, I could re repeat it a couple of times, and you'd be searching for from a kind of uh, speaker pragmatics kind of uh, approach, you sort of be searching for what extra meaning that's not immediately apparent I should be finding there. And I feel like this is a similar thing that, that's happening in music. Um, okay, so then midway between this kind of a repetition and then uh, the repetition of an entire piece where you, you've got something on your iPod and you listen to it several times is the famous part repeat. And we could do like a whole talk just on that because it's it has such an um, amusing history. And um, we can find this this treated most recently in Hebekoski and Darcy's uh, Sonata Form book. Uh, and um, I, I guess I'd like to just state that, you know, we have some form textbooks, like Green's textbook, where he says part repetitions are of little significance in formal analysis. And then um, we have Hebekoski and Darcy saying repeat signs are never insignificant. So we have this kind of um, controversy regarding this question, and it's a very old issue. So you need only to look back to the 1882-83 edition of the Proceedings of the Royal Musical Association to find Ferdinand Prager pleading that, I quote, if the slightest seed has been thrown out to help to the abolition of part repetition, I shall consider this to be one of the happiest days in my life. Um, just, it's, it's so much fun to quote his thing, I gotta quote him a little more. So, would ever a poet think of repeating half of his poem? A dramatist, a whole act, a novelist, a whole chapter? Such a proposition would at once be rejected as childish. Why should it be otherwise with music? Admitting then that the art of the musician is as much a language as the art of the poet, and like the poet's art, it contains within itself the means of expressing sensations and feelings equally as the poet's art, then, since any whole part repetition in poetry would be rejected as childish, or as the emanation of a disordered brain, why should it be otherwise with music? <laughs> um, and I th this is interesting, I think, also just as a side note on this whole notion of relationships between music and language and the one-way kind of arrow that's ex existed between the two um, um, throughout history. Uh, and you, you, can even, you can go back 100 years before that to find people having b basically this, the same issue and the same argument. I'll just, I'm, I'm not gonna read the, the quotations, but just let you know that uh, dur during the same, on the same occasion that uh, Prager was going on about this, uh, Ebenezer Prout responded with a much more sensible kind of, he, he responded uh, in, in favor of, of the part repeat. So um, controversial for, for a very, very, very uh, long time. And um, one interesting kind of historical uh, phenomenon is that it was right around um, the uh, last 25 years of the 18th century that we find both a decline in part repeats in sonata form. So we find uh, that, unless you're writing like a little trivial sort of work, that you, you wouldn't repeat the exposition. And that you, you'll, like regardless of what you're writing, pretty much stop repeating the development and, and recap. And it's interesting that at the same time, um, uh, it was contemporary, uh, contemporaneous with this that the, the rise of Rondo occurred, which is um, you know, repetition but in this other way, right? In this gapped kind of way. Um, so I just find that an interesting um, co-evolution co there. And, uh, and, it's, and it's clear that repetition that's not immediate uh, the, of the sort that occurs in Rondo forms has a different role in historical and aesthetic theories and practices of music. And Elaine Sisman um, actually argues that the two should even be described with uh, different, different terms. Um, and one of the ways in which they're different, um, I'm not gonna play this example, but is that in, in you just have a part repeat. That repeat is usually not acknowledged in within the music itself. 
you just do it and then you do it again and you could sort of do it again or not and it's you know nothing in the music's telling you if you that and it's an interesting case just as a side note um, how performers have approached this so there are some schools that say every time you play it you should make it really different you know or you should make it the same and um, so the same kind of controversy exists in performance but in rondo kinds of forms or where where the repetition is um, there's something intervening between the two repeats um, I, I just like to point out that it's the music the repetition is acknowledged in the music. So all this sort of stuff flourishes with the dominant prolongation and whatever are all about that we're about to get the rondo theme back. So I mean, it's quite clear you couldn't just choose not to play the theme, you know? Um, so, so that's clearly, clearly a, a, a distinction. Um, and if we, if we try to understand the spectrum of repetitions from these, uh, the kind that happens with individual nodes all the way to the kind of part repeat, uh, one of the few people who've tried to sort of get an overview of all of this is the popular music scholar Richard Middleton. And he places each instance of repetition on a spectrum ranging from what he calls musomatic, the immediate repetition of short elements, to discursive, the kind of larger scale section repeats that I've just been discussing. And um, we have uh, then even more re recently Rebecca Layden uh, summarizing his position thus, quote, Middleton argues that a purely musomatic strategy will achieve a kind of psychic resonance for listeners, while discursive strategies will require more of an investment of energy from listeners. His account of discursive structures as requiring energy intersects with Naomi Cummings' account of syntax as a site of intentionality, end quote. So she actually develops this perspective into a theory about repetition's role in the construction of musical subjectivity, particularly in repertoires that could be described as minim minimalist. Um, the other person who's really acknowledged this is David uh, Lidoff, who similarly acknowledges a spectrum of functions for repetition, noting that while it often serves to delineate and segment, repetition can also, quote, create a hypnotic continuity, which is opposite in its effect to segmentation. Meyer has noted, end quote, um, Meyer has noted that repetition increases tension, but that when significantly, uh, significantly prolonged, this tension yields to saturation, which has its own expressive values. Part of the issue is clearly the way that functions and responses change as repetitions continue. Threefold repetition, on which occasion, by the way, the punchline normally appears in American jokes, is different from twofold, but six times is different uh, yet again, and 30 times still more different. So from a discursive perspective, a single repetition is enough to establish a pattern, but from a musomatic perspective, uh, many more may be desirable. And then, of course, perception changes across these repetitions are, are nonlinear. Enjoyment, for example, seems to peak after a moderate number of repetitions, but decrease thereafter. We'll discuss that in a moment. So it's interesting that a rudimentary form of some of these distinctions can be found all the way back in Prager's speech. And I just have to quote from this for one more moment. Um, so my contention, Prager clarifies, does not apply to rhythmical compositions. For example, dances and marches. The case stands entirely different here. <laughs> In rhythmical compositions of this class, the music itself holds but a subordinate position. It's but the supporting accompaniment of rhythmical evolution, supplying the necessary and unchanging accents of the physical movements." End quote. So even in these most rigid of approaches, Prager finds room to acknowledge that repetition can have entirely different functions, depending on the style and aesthetic aims at hand. It's clear that empirical studies of repetition in music must carefully acknowledge and consider the style within which um, stimuli are, are situated and um, to try to understand how, what it is about um, a particular stimulus that encourages a particular attitude towards uh, the repeti repetition. Um, okay. So I wanna talk for a moment about um, sort of the line of research coming out of the mere exposure effect and this notion that uh, after you hear a piece uh, a couple of times, so the example I like to think about is sort of a bad pop song where you hear it and you're fully capable of identifying it as bad. And um, then you hear it a couple of times in your environment and um, you start to like it. <laughs> Admit it. <laughs> so, and then, you know, you can even find yourself doing sneaky things like searching your dial in your car for that bad song. And then after a while, you've had too much of it, and you know you hate it again. We've all had that experience. This seems to be a fairly uh, robust phenomenon, and there's uh, huge literature devoted to this. We've got all the psychoesthetic stuff in the 70s, and then most recently, um, Glenn Schellenberg's been doing some really interesting stuff uh, on this subject. And um, 
I guess all I want to say for the moment is that uh, this kind of effect can vary depending on the music, on the person's background, on the time scale over which, and this is a, a subject that has not been adequately explored, um, how the length of time between repetitions uh, modulates, modulates this effect. There's some, also some literature in sort of marketing and so forth, of course. That's uh, what did this. And um, David Huron has made the observation that although people claim to listen to all kinds of music, so if you start your class asking them what they listen to, they all say, oh, I listen to all kinds. But if you actually check their iPod, uh, you discover that in reality that's not the case. And um, in Sweet Anticipation, David Huron uses data from Billboard magazine in the early 90s to estimate that five albums in the typical listener's collection, uh, quote, account for some 90% of their self-programmed listening, end quote. It's probably a bit different given the way technology has changed. Um, but so in any case, uh, moreover, he observes that these pieces themselves typically contain a large amount of repetition. So by factoring in the prevalence of repeated hearing and what were the repetition already within pieces, uh, David Huron calculates, and this is a personal correspondence quote, quote, 99% of all listening experiences involve listening to musical passages that the listener has heard before. Um, and it's self-evident that not only different pieces, but also different styles and genres feature different degrees of repetition. And we can find very interesting stuff from Scott Burnham about repetition in Schubert, and from um, Mark DeFoto about repetition in, in Debussy. And I think this is the kind of place where um, corpus analysis uh, could, be, could be really, really telling. Um, I'm not going to go over the, the cone third reading stuff because if you were here at that workshop a couple weeks ago, that was brought up this notion that you have sort of a first experience of a piece where you're kind of just making your way through it and it's all about experience. And then a sort of second reading, which may not literally be the second hearing, um, where you're all busy analyzing it and trying to understand it in this really explicit way. And then that the ideal reading is a third reading that may evolve much later down the road where you're able to reintegrate those analytic insights into your experience. And that this is sort of Meyer's notion of the felt dominant, where it, it once more becomes something that's a matter of, um, of experience. So I'd like just very briefly then to talk about um, some work that I did in collaboration with Patrick Wong, who I think was here not too long ago, in which we um, chose a 20-minute piece for full orchestra, Bizet's La Lésienne Suite Number 1, that none of our students or participants were familiar with. And we supervised their exposure to this work, exposure to this work over headphones in the lab five times across a period of 10 days. Um, after each exposure, we asked them to perform a, a set of tasks. And um, we saw that their enjoyment ratings showed the expected inverted U curve, but most interestingly, enjoyment ratings at one session were highly correlated with the number of earworms the participants reported having suffered when asked at the start of the next session. <laughs> So that correlation was um, 0.92. And in an attempt to get at more complex dimensions of participants' experience, we wanted them to, um, in several ways, describe their experience. So they had to say what kind of film they thought it would accompany, how they would review it in an online music database. And then we went through and we coded those descriptions um, in two ways. One for level of analysis, when they were talking about just one aspect of the piece, or they were like, first it does this, and then it does this. We, re we looked at that as a more analytic kind of reading, and um, then we also coded it for engagement. So sometimes you know, you'd have neutral discussions of the piece, and sometimes you'd have, you know, I love this piece, or it's driving me crazy, <laughs> or anything that reflected that they were getting really um, highly engaged with it. And um, so what, what we saw there was that these ratings were consistent with a kind of Conian third reading account of the effect of repetition. So analytic attending peaked on the second <coughs> exposure day, Poked on, uh, peaked on the second exposure day, um, but engagement activity, activity actually diminished for precisely that hearing, peaking, waiting to peak until the last exposure day on day five. So first there was a sort of analysis thing that wasn't fun, <laughs> and then later on they weren't being that analytic about it, but they seemed to be enjoying it a lot more. Um, additionally, and uh, this is where we um, did some of the real-time measures that so, so, many, so much interesting work uh, going on uh, here in relation to, and um, we plotted simply uh, the, the peak tension, moment of tension that, that people reported when they were listening. And this is, I should say, in response only to short segments of the piece that they were exposed to after the full 20 minute piece. They moved a slider to say if it was getting tenser or less tense, and then we just took that peak, the, where, where they thought it was, it was tensest in, in, in the uh, data I'm describing here. And we see that the arrival point of this tension peak um, gets earlier 
uh, as, as the days progress. So it's um, when they sort of know what's, what's going to happen, they start to experience the, the tension associated with a particular event before that event actually occurs. <laughs> and in conjunction with this, perhaps, we see that the height of that tension peak, for the most part, seems to be um, decreasing. So it's less uh, gripping and also earlier, uh, as you sort of uh, anticipate in advance what's going to happen. And the height of the tension peak and the time point of its arrival were, were also highly correlated. Um, okay, let me seek to wrap this up. Um, minutes. Let me say that uh, there's another interesting domain where we can look to try to understand something about the biological function of um, repetition in music. And one would, of course, be um, a comparative approach that looks at other species. And in fact, there's a lot of interesting work on repetition in whales and in birds that I find uh, highly, highly relevant. Um, and additionally, work on infant-directed speech and the precise moment in the developmental trajectory, which is around seven and a half months, when um, parents are most repetitive in speaking with, with their children. And um, the timeline of that seems to uh, progress along with the timeline of uh, babies' ability to segment the speech stream. Um, and soon after they get good at segmenting the speech stream, uh, the repetition starts to sort of fall away. In, in this. So it's, it's at this precise moment where they still need help <laughs> that repetition is used the most. And we could derive a hypothesis from that that there are particular repertoires where we might need more repetition to sort of get a foot on how to listen to it, and that repetition might be more tolerable in um, unfamiliar domains. Okay. Um, so I skipped a number of stuff about Montreal-based stuff about semiotics. But I guess I'll just simply say that I want to suggest that repetition is a worthy subject for much more theoretical and empirical attention than it currently receives. So I'm not going to say, like Ferdinand Prager, that if the slightest seed has been thrown out to help this cause, I shall consider this to be one of the happiest days of my life. But I do think we have a lot to learn about diverse, important subjects by making repetition a focus of inquiry rather than something just that comes out of some inquiry about some other subject related to music. So, thanks.